Psalm chapter 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise this morning. You are a good God, a God who is worthy of the praise that we offer you. A God that is worthy of entrusting ourselves to. And so, Lord, that's what we do this morning. We offer ourselves in worship to you. And, Lord, we pray that your spirit, your presence, would be among us this morning. We pray all of this in your son's name. This morning, we also light our Christ candle as a symbol of the presence of God among us. And so, church, we give thanks to the Lord, for he is here. And let us continue in worship this morning.
scripture reading this morning comes from Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 1 through 6. Hear now the word of the Lord. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who shepherd my people. It is you who have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. So I will attend to you for your evil doings, says the Lord. Then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the lands where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will raise up shepherds over them who will shepherd them, and they shall not fear any longer or be dismayed, nor shall any be missing, says the Lord. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days Judah will be saved, and Israel will live in safety. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated as we continue to worship and song.
this is a trip that she and Ron went on for 30 years. And so uh, this is something that's very dear to her heart. And uh, we just pray over here. Her, we pray for her hips this morning. We pray for uh, safe travels. We pray for especially safe travels there as the hurricane has created a lot of damage there. And so we just want to pray a prayer of God's providence and safety and blessing over her. And so if you would like to come and gather around Karen this morning and pray over her and lay hands on her, we invite you to do so. Amber is also going to be anointed on behalf of her family today. Um, one who is like a grandmother to you and like a mother to Kelly um, has passed away this week, Frida. And so we want to remember Frida's family um, and friends in prayer this morning as they are grieving her loss. We also want to lift up her uncle, James, today, who is in the hospital. And so we want to anoint her in prayer this morning. So if you would like to gather around these two ladies this morning, we would invite you to do so during this time of prayer. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. God. You are a Lord. You are a Lord in the good times when we're rejoicing, when we get good news, and when things are calm. But we also trust that you are a Lord in the bad times, when we are grieving, when we get bad news from the doctor, when, our, when we're worried for the health and the health of those that we love, when we're worried about the world around us, when the waves of chaos are pushing against us and threaten to take us under, we trust that you are still the Lord and that you are with us, that you do not leave us or forsake us, because you are a God familiar with sorrows, and you draw near to the brokenhearted. There is no pain that you do not know, no life that you cannot bring, no hope that you cannot give. So Lord, we lift these requests up to you. And we ask that even when we do not know how, that you would help us trust that you are working. We lift up to you the Petty family and the Copeland family as they grieve the death of Rita. Lord, would your arms of peace wrap around them? Would you provide comfort to them? Would you let them mourn? And would you mourn with them? And would you give them the hope of your resurrection? We also lift up to you James, Kelly's brother-in-law, with his foot and the abscess on his foot. Lord, we pray that you would give him healing, and that you would be with the doctors and his medical team. Lord, there are many who need a special touch of healing this morning. We think of Michaela, or Michaela, Levi's sister, who's going for tests this week. Lord, we ask that you would give her some peace, and that your hand of wisdom and guidance would be upon her medical team. We also lift up to you Everett, who's not feeling well. Lord, we ask that you would give him strength and healing this morning, that you would be with Sarah and Everett. We also lift up to you Karen and her hip, as well as her trip to, trip to Jamaica. Lord, we are so thankful for the ways that you've been at work in her life. But Lord, we, we know that this trip may be a bittersweet. And so we pray that you would be with her, and that you would bless her trip and bless her time in Jamaica, Lord. We lift up all of these health requests and so many more to you, trusting that you are the great physician, and that you are with those who are worried, who are anxious, 
who do not know what the future brings. Lord, would you just be with them? We also lift up to you St. Paul's and the surrounding community during this time of transition. Lord, would your spirit of discernment and guidance just be upon us? We pray that whatever decisions are made in the coming weeks are made for the good of your kingdom. <coughs> that we may be a blessing to those around us. We trust that you are a God of abundant life and grace, even when we do not see how that you are working and that you are transforming us in the world. And so we entrust these many requests to you and pray the prayer that your son taught us to pray with one voice. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And deliver us from temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, it's so good to be gathered with each of you today in the house of the Lord. At this time, we're going to make you aware of just a few announcements that we have upcoming in the life of our church family. But as we begin this, I'm gonna invite Jeannie to come forward. And Jeannie serves as St. Paul's church board secretary, and so she is going to be playing a vital role through this time of pastoral transition. So I'm gonna invite Jeannie to come forward and make just a brief announcement. To, uh, Dr. Eastup asked me to just share a little bit of news about the uh, search for a pastor, and he wanted you to know that we have met with him. We have another meeting uh, in mid-August. Uh, we have um, planned a time, arranged a time to honor our pastors, which is next Sunday, immediately following the service. We are also, we also approved the process for searching and seeking out a new pastor, and that was in your bulletin today. And in addition, we've considered um, uh, interim pastors, and we are working on a church profile. So if you could join us in praying uh, that God's will will guide us throughout this process, and uh, that would be very much appreciated. We appreciate your leadership. A few more announcements that we have upcoming. Um, you've probably seen these several times now. We have uh, Lifeline screening flyers um, at both entrances. Uh, Lifeline health screening will be here at St. Paul's on Monday, uh, July 29th from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, this provides various heart screenings that are available to members of our community, especially for those that might not have insurance or uh, might not uh, be have accessible health care. And so if you know anyone that that can be a resource to, if you would take one of those flyers and get that to them, we would appreciate it. Uh, but we look forward to partnering with Lifeline Screening and serving our community in this way. Uh, Vacation Bible School is coming up really quickly. Um, if you no kiddos, have kiddos, have grandkids, neighborhood kids. Take one of these and give it to them. We would love to have a group, great group of kiddos here for Vacation Bible School. That's going to be August 4th through August 7th. Uh, we are going to begin on Sunday evening, August 4th, with a community cookout in our annual backpack giveaway. Um, that's going to be on August 4th from 5.30 to 7.30. Our goal, again, this year is 50 backpacks. Uh, we 
I exceeded that goal last year and I already saw a great group of backpacks and school supplies in the hallway. So thank you for those who have already donated. Uh, we will again be accepting over the next couple of weeks, uh, but we are excited about serving our community in that way. And then we'll have more traditional vacation Bible school on Monday through Wednesday evenings from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Um, I've had a sign up sheet for VBS and I've had several people sign up. Even if you haven't had a chance to sign up, but you are still interested in serving or helping with VBS, we are going to gather right here in the sanctuary for a five-minute meeting after the service. So even if you haven't signed up, if you're at all interested in serving, even if you can only be here one of the three days, uh, we would love to have you be a part of it. We'll gather right here for a five-minute meeting after the service. We will be gathering uh, on Wednesday, July 31st at 6.30 p.m. to pack backpacks with school supplies and to decorate for Vacation Bible School. So we would love to see a good group up here on Wednesday, July 31st. That's not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday. Um, at this time, I'm going to invite Mel to come up. You may have noticed something special in the bulletin this week that she's going to share about. In October... Uh, we are going to outreach to our neighborhood. We are going to have a women's retreat here at our church on that Friday and Saturday. Um, it'll be the 18th and 19th of October. And we are going to invite a couple of other churches. We're going to put out flyers to all of our neighbors around here. And hopefully we will have a great gathering of women here for a special time together. Okay. Thank you, Mel. This has been something that God's been laying on Mel's heart for a little bit of time now, and we are so thankful for your obedience and willingness to provide leadership for this. And we know you have a great team around you that you've already recruited to be helping with it. And so uh, we are looking forward to this Women's Ladies Retreat coming up in October. Um, you will notice at both entrances we have a help needed <laughs> And I've got a list of different things. Uh, these are things that uh, either Pastor Levi or I or pastoral staff have been helping with. Um, but during the time of pastoral transition, a lot falls on the pastoral staff. And so I want to make sure some of these tasks can be taken care of by members of the congregation to help them out and to take some of the burden off of our pastoral staff. Um, so some of this is going to include locking and closing facilities after Sunday morning service. So if you are willing to do that, we would love to have you sign up. Uh, Mel and Michaela have already generously offered they are going to open the facilities each week, so get everything going and rolling. We appreciate that. Um, cleaning the facilities one week per month. Um, we have a couple of people that already help with this. Uh, Patty Johnson helps one week a month. Um, Jeannie and Tim team up for one week a month. Um, but my two weeks that I've been covering need to, to be covered in the coming months. And so uh, if you would be willing to help with that, it doesn't have to be done by just one person. If you'd like to put together a pair or a team, that would per be perfectly fine as well. And then setting up tables for Sunday morning breakfast. This is usually Pastor Daniel <laughs> every week. Um, but this is something that we would love to have help with so that as he's performing some other pastoral tasks on Sunday morning, some of his time would be freed up. And so if you would be willing to help set up tables for Sunday morning breakfast, if you would sign up for that as well, we would greatly appreciate that. And then finally at this time, I'm going to invite Pastor Daniel forward. Okay. There very well could be something else that I'm forgetting, so we might come back to it. <laughs> uh, but we want to honor and recognize Pastor Daniel today. Uh, as many of you know, um, he was ordained in the Church of the Nazarene yesterday, and it was such a special service there at College Church, and it has been so wonderful to see God's call upon his life, and to see the way that his ministry is a blessing to so many. And yesterday was really just the confirmation and the affirmation of what you've known from God for a long time, that the church affirming and confirming those gifts and graces in you. And we've all benefited for a long time from his ministry, but we are so excited for this next step of obedience uh, in your ministry, and we are so excited for what God has in store. And thank you for being a blessing to all of us.
Well, at this time, well, actually, Daniel, if you'll stay right here. <laughs> <laughs> this might have been what he was thinking. At this time, I'm going to invite everyone to stand. We're going to pass the peace now to everyone, but I especially want to give you an opportunity to come and to greet and congratulate Pastor Daniel. Church, may the peace of Christ be with you. And, and also with you. Let us turn and greet one another with the peace of Christ. faithfulness 
the theme for district assembly this year was from generation to generation and celebrating God's faithfulness through the generations. Uh, one of the things that we uh, were awarded this week, um, I will, I want to introduce Danae as our new NMI president. <laughs> so she is going to be serving on the church board as our NMI president this year, and we received some pretty cool awards that she wants to share more about with you. Yes, thank you. I had the honor of attending um, some of the district assembly last week, and we received two awards, so that was very exciting. Um, the first one we received is um, um, a Church of Excellence for Nazarene Missions International um, for giving over the 5.5 um, amount of income for a church. So that is very exciting. Thank you for your <laughs> We also received another um, award where we were called a Missions Priority One Church. And um, we received this award in recognition for our praying, giving, educating, and educating our children and youth. Amen. So congratulations, St. Paul. Amen. Well, we are so thankful to all of you for your faithfulness. We are really excited about uh, Danae being willing to step in this position and provide some leadership in the area of missions. Um, we are just excited what God has in store. At this time, I'm going to invite Tim forward. I would give you my mic over there. I can grab mine. I, I think I can belt it out pretty good. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good job. I always like to say we are the biggest little church I know and I'm always amazed at what what we can do because God works through us amen thank you for being faithful as pastor Becca mentioned and I we have two wonderful ushers who are coming forward this morning Good to have you back, Anthony. And if any of you are fans of Super Mario Brothers, put a little extra in the offering. Um, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, thank you, thank you. For you are a holy, holy, holy God. Amen. We praise you and thank you for the faithfulness of this congregation. May you bless the gift and the giver. And we pray that you would help us to use these funds wisely here and throughout the world. Amen. Amen.
Thank you, Karen. Beautiful. The Lord has brought us this far, and he will lead us home. Amen? Amen. Amen. So good to be with you this morning, and uh, it's been about nine years since I've been in this pulpit to preach God's word. And uh, so thank you for this privilege and this joy to be with you today. And haven't we enjoyed in these days, these years, the leadership of Pastor Becca and Levi? Can we just thank them this morning? Thank you. Amazing, amazing servants of God and uh, both just so gifted, so talented. And we're truly grateful. If you would turn in your Bible to 1 Samuel or on your phone, poke on your Bible app, whatever it is that you do, uh, your iPad, your phone, your Bible. We're going to be in several passages today. Primarily we'll be in 1 Samuel chapter 8. 1 Samuel chapter 8, it's a long passage so we won't stand, but uh, let's read this together. Reading from the New Revised Standard Version. When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. Yet his sons did not follow in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, You are old! Has anybody ever heard that before? <laughs> you are old, and your sons do not follow in your ways. Appoint for us then a king to govern us like other nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to govern us. Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people. In all that they say to you, for they have rejected, they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Just as they have done to me from the day I brought them up out of Egypt to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so also are doing to you. Now then, listen to their voice only. You shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel reported all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king. He said, there, there will be, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his courtiers. He, shall, he will uh, take one-tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and his courtiers. He will take your male and female slaves and the best of your uh, cattle and donkeys and put them to work. He will take one-tenth of your flocks, and you shall be his slaves. And in that day, you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. <sighs> These are hard words. But the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. They said, no, but we are determined to have a king over us, so that we also may be like other nations, and that our king, may govern us and go out before us to fight our battles. When Samuel had heard all these words of the people, he, rep he repeated them to the ears of the Lord. The Lord said to Samuel, listen to their voice and set a king over them. Samuel then said to the people of Israel, each of you return home. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In his book, simply titled The Church, pastor and author and theologian Brent Peterson leads us into a look at what is the church? What is her biblical role? Who are the people that compose the church? And so on and so on. Key to the text, Peterson wants us to understand two ecclesial, and that word ecclesial is just a $50 Greek word for the church. Two ecclesial paradigms the church might walk in, and these are those two paradigms. 
The church might walk in and what's, what is called a martyr ecclesiology or a martyr church way. A way of living that models the, the, the Jesus way by laying down its life uh, for the other, for the sake of salvation, for the sake of the community and the world. A way in which the church surrenders fully to the words and way of Jesus in life and death and in resurrection ways. This is the first way that we can view the church and the role and position of the church in society in this martyr ecclesial or martyr church way. The second is an empire ecclesiology or an empire way of living. The church, this, this way of empire is rooted in fear and encourages us to seek our own happiness at the expense of those around us. The way, the way of the empire is at the expense of those around us. The way of the empire tells us we should take we should take what matters matters into our own hands. We refusing to trust anyone because other people are potential threats. Within an empire imagination, our personal liberties and freedoms must never be transgressed, even if that means other people will suffer. The way of the empire is ultimately anxious and, and insecure. It's never at rest. It's never at peace for fearing of others. And, and it's always ready to take what, what we believe or what people of the empire believe is theirs. Now with this in mind, we come to this text. Remember last week, Pastor Rebecca preached to us from chapter 7 about this fretful time, this frightful time when the Philistines were upon the, the people of Israel and they cried out to God one more time, please save us, save us. And so there were prayers said, and there was this place that God saved them. They, they called it Ebenezer, this place of salvation for the people. And so God did save them. And a peace was on the land. If you look at chapter 7, verse, uh, verse 14, C, it says that peace is on the land. All is right in the kingdom. There's peace in the land. And so confessions were said, enemies were routed. Now in chapter 8, it's like we just cue Jenna Jackson's song all over again. What have you done for me lately? Right? Oh, it's going to be in your head now. And this cycle of deep-seated longing for self-fashioned empire continues to get revved up and cranked up. So Samuel was old. His boys living blatantly unholy lives in southern Israel. That's where Beersheba is. Look at verse 3. Yet his sons did not follow in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. Now, I just want to stop right there on the perversion of justice for just a moment. We can come to understand what God feels about in terms of perverting justice. If we want to just turn over to Exodus chapter 23, verse 8. Again, you're going to use your Bible. Get me up here preaching. We're going to, we're going to hunt it down in the Bible. So here we go. Exodus chapter 23, verse 8. We come to understand what God uh, is, uh, how he views brides and the perversion of justice. In Exodus chapter 23, verse 8. You shall take no bribe. For a bride blinds the officials and subverts the cause of those who are in the right. Also in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17. If you'll just go over there real quick. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 7. Deuteronomy, I'll get there in just a moment. So glad I hear the Bible pages turning. That's awesome. Chapter 10, verse 7. I'll get there in just a moment. But it also speaks to us about this. It says, uh, chapter 10, verse 7. From there, they journeyed to uh, Gudaga, and from Gudaga to Jorabeth, the land which, uh, with flowing streams. At that time, the Lord set apart the tribe of Levi to carry the arks of the covenant of the Lord, to stand before the Lord, to minister to him, and to bless his name. Therefore, Levi. Uh, therefore, Levi has a lot of inheritance with the kindred, so on and so on. So, uh, this passage also speaks to this kind of bribery. In Micah chapter three, verses one through four, we won't go through that. 
that also talks about uh, this perversion of justice. Perverting justice, among other things, if you want to write this down this morning, equals seeing other people as days. Have you ever done that in your life? If those crazy drivers would just learn how to drive right on, on, on 435, right? If those, um, if those Democrats, if those Republicans, if they would just dot, dot, dot. If those uh, servers at the restaurants would just get their act together, right? If those Ukrainians, if those Russians would just, and so we begin to they people, we begin to other people. And at the heart of the perversion of justice is losing sight of the singularity of the human being. Right. Instead of seeing people as human beings, we lump them, we clump them. Well, if those Latinos in that neighborhood would just get it together, if those African Americans, if those white folk, if those, if those people, they, if they would just do, if those people, and we lose sight of the individual of the singular, on behalf, and instead, we choose to, to lump people into categories. This, I think, brothers and sisters, is, is at the heart of the perversion of justice. As we look at, as we look at uh, these people that uh, were supposed to be God's people, Joel and Abijah, they begin to take their position and begin to use people and step on people and climb into ladders of leadership, which wasn't for them to have, rather for them to be in certain people. Positions of servitude of the people, perversion of justice. The people now know with Samuel's sons doing what they're doing, a now, get this, 200 year old longing since the time of Gideon of yearning that they would have a king is now coming into fruition. See verse 4. Then, then is a key word. At this time, they know these two guys are off the rails. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together. Yet you can just see them, right? They gathered together. This is our shot. This is our chance. Now we can just get in here and get what we want. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, You are so old, and your sons do not follow in, in your ways. Appoint for us, then, a king to govern us. Right? And so they use this time to slip in. Language that, look at the language of us. Appoint for us. Then a king to govern us, like all the nations. But this is pleasing. So they said, give us a king to govern us. Right? You just highlight all the us language there. You'll see how pretty self-focused these folks are. And then, so these are some of the scariest words. Look at verse 7. Verse 7. Sorry, I don't have my readers on here today, so I'm doing my best. Give us a king to govern us. Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people and all that they say to you, semicolon, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I would... Put on trial today that these are some of the hardest words to hear, maybe in all of Scripture. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me. So go ahead, let it roll. That's hard. They have rejected me. When I read this passage, I sat back and I went, Whew. wow. Those are some powerful words. The people of God have been knocking on the front door, heavily clamoring to be like their neighbors, being, being uh, delivered has been old hat. Egypt is long gone. It has been. It's over. It's new school now. We're going to do things the way we want to do it. Vertical kingship is now passe. Incomplete, washed out, washed up. It's over. God's had his time. Now we're going to roll this way. God has been officially rejected. And God acquiesces. And God says, okay. 
Now, if you look at that passage carefully, give us a king to govern us. King is language of Messiah. Give us a Mashiach. Give us someone who will deliver us and fight our battles and do our thing. And it, it, it precursors, it predates that, that time where Jesus rolls into Jerusalem on a donkey. Hail the Messiah, King of kings, Lord of lords. This is not the Mashiach that we had in mind. So let's just crucify him. And things hadn't changed over the next 600 years, did they? But we'll get there in just a moment. But by final check of God, before he finally checks off and engages, um, and before he gives in to the BK, let's have it your way, there's one more thing that he wants to do. And this is really quite tragic. And this is where we need to be careful. He lays a list out for all the things that are going to happen if this is what they want. This is what you're going to get. This is the empire that you're asking for. This is where you're headed. And look at verse 19 real quick. They, got, they come through all this. But the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. They said, no, but we are determined to have a king over us. Let's just break that down. Just these few words. The, the people refused to listen. The people refused to listen. This is not the martyr church. This is not the, the, the church that lays down its life for the other. This is the beginnings of empire building. You know, right? Ooh, somebody. Together we shall rule the universe, right? Like this is this is the beginning of that type of age. This is the beginning of that type of age to come. The people refuse to listen. We can think about times. Well, we've been in that position. God, I know that what you're saying is right and true. But I want to do this. And the next words are, we are determined to have. And this is why every Sunday when we come to this table... Our pastors so graciously remind us again and again and again that we come to the table with open hands, ready to receive, because we don't get, we are given to. Right. We are determined to have. And then we move, read on so that we also may be like other nations and that, and highlight this, bracket this in your Bible, that our king may govern us and go out before us and fight our battles. Some of the scariest words in scripture are just those two little words that our king, our king. Now, we just need to step back from all this for just a second. I've thought about this passage long and hard for the last several weeks. Holy Spirit, what are you saying to us just now as a church? What's he saying to you right now as an individual? What is Holy Spirit saying to you right now? What is he saying? Now, what is Holy Spirit saying to us as a church? Just step back from this for just a moment. As a big C church and little C church, what's he saying to us? Have we slipped into empire living? Have we said from time to time, no, we are going to have it our way. 
It's a bit scary to consider all the times we as individuals or as the church have or are now saying, no, God, thanks, God. We'd like to do it this way. We are or have been determined to have it this way. And before we know it, the Jesus way of God or gets co-opted to the way of the empire. The danger resting in the space where we still claim to be a holiness people. Don't miss that. We want to co-opt God's plan, God's way, God's words, and we do things in an empire way, and then we just slap a little label on it. We'll sing a good song. We'll, we'll hey, brother, how you doing? You know, and then all along the way, we're doing it our way. It should be an alarming passage for us. So what do we do? We've seen the, the messes we've created with with substitute kings. The freedoms we once thought that were, were going to be gained are now restrictive and constraining in our lives. The lie of Satan always says this. Don't miss this, young people. If you do this, you'll have your freedom, and it's going to be fantastic. I'll take you places you've never been before. It's going to be awesome. Live and let live. Don't let, don't let scripture bind you down. Don't let this, this preacher bind you down. It's going to be great. And by the time we realize it in our freedom, we find ourselves in the most restricted of jails. Bound to, to this freedom that he promises. So what do we do? We realize Romans 125 is true. That we've exchanged the truth of God for a lie. We fail to live into his desire, an ability to care for us, and his ability to lead us, and his ability to, to, to come along, as Psalm 23 said, that, that we can't, that he leads us beside still waters, that he gives us cool drink and in the green pastures. No, God, you let us down. You let me down. You failed. Has anybody been there? I have. We're going to just true talk in here today. Have you been there? You let me down. Look at this trash heap that I drive. Look at this, look at this, this, this dinky house that I live in. But it's not about that, brothers and sisters. He's always faithful. Amen. He's always faithful. Praise the Lord. In Matthew. Chapter 3, verse 2, and Matthew 4, 17. We're left with this conundrum. What do we do? As Holy Spirit speaks to us this morning. And maybe he's saying to our hearts, and maybe in some of our hearts today, they're beating out of our chest. That's me, Lord. I've come to church. I've done this. I've done that. I've been faithful. I've given. But if I'm honest with you, God, today... There's areas of my life where I've done it my way. And so what do we do? In Matthew chapter 3, verse 2, Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. And this is not preaching that you hear very often in churches today. And I make no apologies for it. Both these men come into the world and say, repent. Repent. <clears throat> For the kingdom of God is near. Right. Repent. Oh, but it's 2024. We can't talk about repentance. We've got other stuff to go to. But John and Jesus are saying in these passages, repent. You're living in the empire. You're living in the empire way. Come back. Come back to me. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Can I ask you this morning today, what is the longing of your heart this morning? What is the longing of your heart this morning? What is the Holy Spirit 
saying to your heart this morning? Oh, maybe you didn't consciously say, I want it my way. But you can see your life drifting in that direction and slapping a little God and a little Holy Spirit all along the way, all the way through it. Do you need a king transplant? Is that a fair question? Do we as a church need a king transplant? Is having me, myself, and I calling the shots working for you? How's that working for you? I know for me in my life, I realize that, that the, the holiest day for me is the happiest day for me. When I've acquiesced to the voice of Satan or decided what I wanted to do, I feel that drifting. I feel that distance. I feel that, in some cases, even shame. That, that, that space between God and I and that relationship just gets wider and wider. But we, when we settle the kingship issue in our life, when we settle the lordship issue in our life, <laughs> it's like Boris Gump, peas and carrots, peas and carrots, right? <laughs> we just feel that closeness, that nearness. And maybe you're distant today. And the Holy Spirit is saying, you might have a king issue. As individuals, as a church, if we're honest, if we're honest, we know we need to make Yahweh the king again. Walking in the martyr church way, stepping out into the open road of trust, true trust in God, and serve and love him alone. We know it, don't we? We know it. And we sing these songs with the king of my heart, be the captain of my soul. Are those mere words for us today? No. We are determined to have a king over us. And if we really got into this text, it would move us to tears. That's super sad. <laughs> But we have this Messiah, we have this King, who said, get this, you guys. I'm going to be offered up in front of the priests and the people, and I'm going to be wounded. Isaiah reminds us of that. And I'm going to take on your transgressions. And I'm going to take on your wounds and your scars. And I'm going to be crucified. And I'm going to die. But on the third day... I'm going to be resurrected and the stone of the empire is going to be rolled away. Amen. That's our hope today. This and I'll close. This summer I've had the wonderful opportunity to work um, and I'm moving in a different direction in a week or so. But I've had a wonderful opportunity to work um, in the mental health field. Um, one of my friends in that field is here today, a friend of mine that I met. And she came, and I'm so thrilled for that. But we were talking about um, the work that we do in the mental health field. And we both kind of agreed that there were times that we wish, and when we were with clients and, and out and about in the community, we both just kind of wish we could just say, you know what you need? <laughs> you just need a good dose of salvation. Yeah. <laughs> right? Right? You just need a king change, a priority change, a kingdom change, a kingdom shift. And I will say this not because Pastor Levi and Becker are here, and, and they know this to be true. When I was pastor here, it was true of, of that time as well. It may be that today, kingship really isn't an issue for us as St. Paul's body. But I think this passage stands as its own Ebenezer to remind us that today the Lord has helped us here. Amen. But it could be today that there's someone who says, I got to swap kings. I got to swap. I'm living for me. And so today, before we come to this table, I'd love for us to bow our heads and close our eyes for just a moment.
And it may be just in these words, Lord, I've tried it my way. And I'm so tired of that. I'm so sick of that. I'm messing this thing up. And I want to swap chains. And I want you to come into my heart, Lord. And help me live for you, the King of Kings. And Lord of Lords. I can't do this anymore. I'm tired of being the captain of my own ship. Tired of all of that, Jesus. And I need you right now to come into my heart and be the king of my heart. Would you pray that prayer? I need a new Messiah. And I'm choosing you. With your hands bowed and your eyes closed. If that was you today, we're just going to take a little time. If that was you today, I pray that prayer. Would you confess? that just openly today. I'd love for you to just slip out from where you are and um, I'd love to come down and pray with you. Pastor Becca, I invite her to come as well. We said, Pastor Matt, I'm going in a different direction today. Would you just pray for me? I've swapped out kings. Anybody like that today? I've swapped out kings. table today as we prepare our hearts to receive these elements be our Mashiach be the Messiah that we belong for in our hearts and in our lives and help us as your church, as your body, as your people to not get swept away and carried away with the voices of the empire that would remind us that we could sprinkle a little bit of this and a little bit of this and a little bit of that of human ingenuity into it. God, as we seek you today, as we seek you in pastoral transition, we are humbly coming before you today to say, Lord, we can't do it, but you can. We can't make sense of it, but you can. We don't know who you have for us, but we know that you do. So, Lord, we are surrendering our individual and collective selves to you today so that all of us is crucified, as Galatians 2.20 says, that we are crucified with Christ, that we no longer live, but that Christ lives in us. And we surrender that to you today in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. As, Dan, as Levi continues to play, let us prepare our hearts to come to the table. At this table, we were reminded that we serve our risen Lord Jesus Christ, a Lord who calls us to cast aside all other lords. We serve Jesus as Lord, no other person, no other ideology, no other group or leader. Jesus is Lord. And so we come to this table because Christ our Lord invites us to his table and invites all those who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. 
Therefore, let us confess before God and one another. Most merciful of God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we might delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Church, hear this good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, proving God's love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are a forgiven people. Thanks be to God. And so, on the night in which he gave himself up for us, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, and when he gave it to his disciples and said, Take it, eat, All this is my body, which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Let us pray. Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. 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 Church, in just a moment, I'm going to invite you to come down the center aisle, to come and receive the elements and then to take them back to your seat where we will all partake together once everyone has received the elements. Church, we come with open hands, held ready to receive the good gifts of God because we cannot earn this or deserve this or take this for ourselves. The gifts of God are gifts that we receive by faith. So church, come, taste and see that the Lord is good. Church, I invite you to pull back that first layer to reveal the bread. Church, this is the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, broken for you. Take, eat, and be grateful. 
I invite you to hold back the second layer to reveal the juice. Church, this is the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take, drink, and be grateful. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.